here you are. The post post modern. We are going to touch the year 2001 with a piece by Libby Larson. Um, it's going to take us from about 1968 or uh, 1970, um, 30 years, and then I'm going to say stop because I don't think, uh, first of all, there's not any more time in the semester. And it's really tricky to analyze the music of the time you're in. Um, it's hard to say for sure where we are now and where we've been. We can try, and lots of people have opinions, um, and they're all. I think if they're well supported, they're valid. The problem is, what will we say in 30 years when we look back and say, oh, that's what we were doing. We didn't know. Um, so postmodernism, um, some of the, the issues are how do you sustain postmodernism? How do you sustain the collage of signifiers in historical postmodernism? There's no self there. It's overwhelming. How do you keep the self out of minimalism when you've said, no progressions, no nothing, just be. How do you keep that? We've already seen, as I mentioned in the previous video, in the works of John Adams, that he has a tendency to not stay in pure minimalism. In fact, he seems to blend a little bit of historical postmodernism and minimalism together. So there is a convergence in the mainstream um, of the signifier separated out those those reminders of things and the thing itself, they converge back again. We can't keep them separate in our humanness. So perhaps you could call this a contamination of minimalism by more and more surface detail, by harmonic variety, a sense of arrival sometimes, even lyrical melody. John Adams is a great case in point here the chairman dances, for example, uh, from related to Nixon in China. Um, where is it? Never mind. I was going to talk about it, but I won't because I can't find it. It's here somewhere. Yes. Um, so, you know, the chairman dances, a 1987 opera about Nixon in China. This is hyper real. It's a fantasy of what happened when Nixon, the President of the United States, went to China, the enemy of the United States. This is not what really happened. This is a hyper-real, signifier-filled opera, and yet it's got minimalist bits in it. Short Ride in a Fast Machine is minimalist in its looping rhythmic cycles. Um, there are parts where there is no melody. It is absent, or it depends on the observer. Yet, there is a huge theatrical crescendo climax, a soaring melody. Hang on to that soaring melody because it's going to be relevant in John Schwantner's writing in the concerto that you have on your listening list. There is plenty of diatonicism in Short Ride in a Fast Machine. It sounds like it's in keys. We've really left those tone rows far behind. I don't think a lot of people find it sustainable for a lifetime. And you know what? This short ride in a fast machine, it's fun. Gosh, when was the last time art music was fun? It's been a while, you know? I mean, think about expressionism. That was not fun. That was like, ow. And we went through a, basically an apocalypse. We went through modernism, which said, don't smile because it's irrelevant. Whether you like it or not, who cares? And now it's suddenly like, this actually is kind of fun. So maybe that's good. Maybe that's what post-postmodernism is. It's more fun. Um, so postmodernism uh, seems to, in some ways, post-postmodernism re-blends signifier and signified. But we've allowed ourselves to say old is welcome. New is welcome. Popular music is legitimate and welcome. Rock is just as good as classical, even if the audiences don't seem to at this point agree necessarily. Um, fake is good. Real is good. You know that old sonata form? It was a little bit too much frou-frou, too much trouble, but it was okay. So post-postmodernism seems to be a sort of of, of linking or gearing up 
of things that were violently opposed and separated in the 1968 to 72 sort of apocalyptic point. Um, let me see. Uh, no, we said that already. We said that already. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, now about um, these composers at the end of your list. It's hard for me to say for sure where we should put them, but the point here is to see where these threads from the 20th century have ended up in the works of these composers. So, first one, Arvo Pert, uh, a 1977 piece, uh, Tabula Rasa. Um, Arvo Pert was, uh, is, um, was writing uh, music that he, he started off um, doing collage, like his postmodernist pilot on collage. And part, Arvo Pert said, um, this is not going anywhere for me. It's too much. It's too pointless. It's too crazy. He sort of actually took a break from composing. Um, it didn't sort of. He took like about a five-year break and stopped composing. And then in 1976, he came up with his own new style of composition. It's called Tintinabuli. Tintinabuli. The word tintinare in Latin means to jingle. It's an onomatopoetic word. Tin, 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 tin is like the jingling of bells. His Tintinabuli style is um, a sort of postmodernist redo of medieval music in some ways, and it also comes off sounding kind of minimalist in some ways. So it's its own collage. It's a postmodernist collage of things that were not meant to be collaged. Um, the harmonic content of Arvo Pert's music, like this tabula rasa, is diatonic. We are talking about simple scales, no chromatic inflection, just let them be. And so we will actually often hear a scale descending or ascending, and that's like a measuring stick. And against it are these cycling arpeggiations of the tonic triad. So maybe you have do, mi, so, do, mi, so, do, mi, so, and while that's happening, then I go do, re, mi, fa. If my hand could make a noise, I should have instruments or something. Um, so, so you get these sort of chiming, bell-like chiming things of, of scale-like melodies against a, a tonic triad. There's no harmonic motion because we're on tonic triad, but it's there. Um, to me, having listened to, or maybe I'm doing it right now while you're watching this, listening to English bell ringing, where you take bells in a tower, say you take eight bells, da 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 and they just chime. And then you let the bells chime out of order, da 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 and then you swap out like bells two and three and bells four and six, da 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 these these sort of coincidental reorganizations of a scale, a simple major scale, creates this cool like Where's the melody? It sounds like things are changing, even though there's really a very static progression. There's no progression going on. Um, uh, uh, another piece that's fun to perform is Spiegel im Spiegel, which I think is originally written for two cellos or two harps. It means mirror against mirror. I've played it an arrangement of horn and harp of this piece, which consists entirely of dotted whole notes. Um, and it's two minutes or more of whole notes. Uh, you know, you're just sitting there playing whole notes. It's like doing um, long tones in a nice scale fashion, and it's pretty. But I'll tell you, it's really hard for a wind player. You, uh, I mean, it's fine to say, oh, I do long tones every day. Yeah, do you do two minutes of them without stopping at all? Maybe you do. Good for you. It's hard. Um, his ideas, Pert's ideas about this music, come from his devout Eastern, or Eastern Orthodox Christian beliefs. He is trying to write music that he perceives as religious, which is interesting because Eastern, Eastern Orthodox worship does not include written out music for instruments. That's not allowed in Eastern Orthodox worship. 
Um, so he's trying to write music that reminds him, that sounds like it's from the Middle Ages, from the, the moment of the Great Schism, where the Eastern Church split off from the Western Church. Um, he's trying to write music for a church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, that does not allow him to write instrumental music to be used in worship, but he is doing it anyway. He's sort of making thus music that is more religious and more medieval than it really was back in the Middle Ages. It's not medieval. It's better than that. It's not just religious, it's better than that. It's hyper-real. So you can see that postmodernist love of hyper-reality there. Um, it seems simple. It seems kind of new age, like let's get a massage, cycle the music through. But it is not. For Arvo Parrot, he does not intend it to be any of those superficial things. And that's where it's not minimalist either, because for him it has depth, whereas minimalism is no depth at all. So, yay, Arvo Parrot. Um, I have a picture. I'm going to put it up. I'm going to show you my picture, because I don't think I can actually draw it on screen. Um, can you see my picture? See this? So, this drawing represents rhythm is the crescendo and then this circle-y thing is a cyclic melody and how they intersect is one way that you can imagine how Perrot sees rhythm and music intersecting in his work. It's these intersecting cycles, processes, not a plan of tension resolution or narrative or tone row, it's just that's that's what it is. Um, yeah. Uh, we already talked about John Adams. Allow me to flip hastily forward to George Crumb. Uh, he was born in 1929. I am not sure he is still with us, actually. I should update that. 1970, Ancient Voices of Children. Like Berio, he quotes older music in a postmodernist collage. But some signifiers in this work are actually strong enough that they dominate the sort of collage and they actually start to tell us something. Narrative accidentally leaks in just because of some of the signifiers sort of shouting more than others. Um, for example, we hear Bach played on a toy piano. That's why the toy piano, by the way, uh, was in the classroom this semester. Heaven forbid when I use this video in later semesters. Um, because um, the, I think, is it the um, Contemporary Music Ensemble's working on Ancient Voices of Children. And you should go hear Kat Ambrister and the people involved in it. You should hear them do that, unless it's already happened, in which case you should listen to the stream of it. Um, so uh, we hear Bach played on a toy piano. The oboist goes off stage to perform, to quote Mahler. These are signifiers, and we are supposed to get them. We are supposed to hear Bach played on a toy piano and say, Oh, Bach, I recognize it. Toy piano, voices of children. We're supposed to hear the quote of Mahler and think, Kinder Toten Lieder dead children's songs that Mahler wrote towards the end of his career. This very depressed and depressing text. They're, these are signifiers that we are supposed to hear. That's why it's postmodernist and not modernist. These signifiers take us not only across time, back in time, forward in time, but they take us across wor the world, trans world. We hear Asian temple bells, we hear extended techniques on the instruments. We hear American folk sounds. We hear the water gong. The music's formal structure is simple. The texture is monody and heterophony. When was the last time we ever talked about heterophony? We sort of use it in world music discussions, but we don't much use it in Western art music. It's not a thing once we start writing music down. But that is really what's going on here. The texture is monody, monophonic, or heterophonic. The timbre, here's where we see the legacy of modernism. The timbre is incredibly rich. If there's anything we learned from people like Varez and Stockhausen and Zanakis, among other things that we learned from them. But we learned to listen to timbre as hard as we had ever listened to Mahler melodies. 
So, George Crumb, Ancient Voices of Children, you can say um, some style characteristics would be, it is a postmodernist collage of signifiers. The musical, some musical signifiers direct the piece, direct the piece. Some musical signifiers direct the piece. The piece unites disparate elements of timbre, melody, and rhythm through time and distance. The piece unites disparate elements of timbre, melody, and rhythm through time and distance. And that's what I talked about. Not only are we referring to Bach and Mahler, but we're referring to folk music, different world musics. And so I think that's, we're going to leave that, that there, um, but you need to go listen to this piece. Um, I'm going to come back to David Del Tredigy because it's my favorite one. Um, but here we're going to, um, I'm going to go to Libby Larson first, and then I'm going to back up to Del Tredigy. Um, so Libby Larson, born in 1950, um, she is a, we could say a neo-tonalist. And she really forges ahead and creates a name for herself in the last 30 years of the 20th century and onward. Um, is really Libby Larson, I think, I feel like she is our first woman composer on the scene that we are comfortable with since, I want to say since Clara Schumann, but that that is just, um, I mean, I've left out people like Amy Beach, I've left out Nadia Boulanger, but she becomes the kind of iconic woman composer figure that we have not been able to wave a flag for since Clara Schumann, maybe. Um, she is an incredibly prolific composer. Um, I actually looked some of these things up on re from reviews and biographies of this living composer, which is kind of cool. It's like, I just went and found out, it's like I want to go up to her and say, hi, Libby Larson, tell me about yourself. Um, she, you could say she is in energetic, optimistic, she composes largely in tonality without harsh dissonance. Um, one of my favorite pieces that I haven't been able to retrack down since I heard it was a really cool setting of um, works that relied on Boogie Woogie. So here we are at the end of the 20th century and she's writing things that sound like 1920s, 30s Boogie Woogie. What is going on? Um, she loves to use the American vernacular and idioms, signifiers, if you will, that are familiar in her context. Um, sometimes uh, she will write things that, has no, that have no bar lines, actually, and then gradually meter will sort of fade its way back in. So she, again, takes things from the modernists and the collage composers who are writing things that need only be measured in seconds. They don't need to be notated in musical rhythmic units. But then she's able to sort of phase that work, tie that back into traditionally notated historical art music rhythm notation, for example. Um, Barn Dances from 2001. You have to listen to one movement of Barn Dances. I've put that link on Cougar View, I believe. Um, the question I have for you is how does this piece hold up to Copeland? Originally I had Billy the Kid on your listening list and I took it off because it was too long. But if you listen to Copeland's ballet, Billy the Kid, which evokes and creates that, remember? Creates the American prairie sound, this fake, sort of this idealized mythology of the cowboy days out on the prairie. How do barn dances compare to it? Remember, barn dances comes after we've had minimalism and the sort of flourishing of historical postmodernism. So listen to barn dances, and I think you will hear this, we'll hear American vernacular idioms used as signifiers. I think you will hear the rhythmic cycles uh, that can connect not only to act to art music, but can connect to minimalism. Um, and I would say we this this piece um, focuses on tonality 
energy and optimism. Those three things I used to describe her character, I think we can hear tonality, energy, and optimism embedded in the way this piece is created. Um, let me now talk about my favorite piece, David Del Tredici's um, series of works called Final Alice. Um, Del Tredici, born in 1937, um, he wrote, this wrote a series of works on the book, the two books, by the Victorian writer and mathematician Lewis Carroll. Um, the book you may be familiar with is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The second volume is called Through the Looking Glass and What She Found There. You've watched all these movies about Alice in Wonderland with Johnny Depp and stuff. You need to go back and read the original books, actually, to get a clue. Um, the movies are good, but you got to know where you started. <laughs> Um, the two books by Lewis Carroll were groundbreaking because they were really a significant sort of children's fantasy fiction book when none really existed to that depth. Um, the two books are filled with a combination of logic, surreal juxtapositions, grim humor, and nostalgia. Um, the, at one point, um, Alice says, well, I can't stop growing. I'm a child. That's what children do. Um, I can't just tell myself to stop growing. And uh, the, I think it's the griffin or the caterpillar says, well, you could certainly stop growing if somebody helped you. Like, if you were murdered. Like, that's pretty grim. But it's the kind of thing that actually kids kind of, a lot of kids really kind of get that grim humor. My niece Emily, for the longest time, would sing the folk song, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, My Bonnie Lies Over the Sea, as My Body Lies Over the Ocean, My Body Lies Over the Sea. It sounded so grim. And it, she just thought that was the funniest thing. I mean, she's a perfectly normal child, but this, it was just hilarious. It's like a kid finding a dead frog on the playground and saying, cool, look at that. And in the Lewis Carroll books, the Alice in Wonderland books, there's all this logic, but it's taken to the point of absurdity. And it's full of all of these hidden meanings. How very postmodernist. But these books date from the 1880s, 1870s, excuse me. So Del Tredigy writes a series of works that refer to these things. And there's also in the Lewis Carroll books, the, Lewis Carroll himself has this nostalgia for childhood. And it's apparent in these books. This is a perfect stew for a postmodernist to muse and create in. Um, uh, what do I want to say? The, Del Tredici, like Philip Glass, comes to find success, popular success as a composer, in a way that was now so foreign to art musicians. People were like, yeah, this is cool, that it seemed kind of strange. It's okay if people like it. So you have to listen to the acrostic song. Let's get some style characteristics here, and then I'm going to talk about it first of all. So first of all, Final Alice, a style characteristic is that it is strophic. It's the same music repeated, and the same, and the words, the text is in stanzas. When was the last time we had a structured poem giving structure to the music? Okay, Pure Lunaire. But when was the time before that? I'm thinking leader. It is diatonic. Um, the recording that I've put online for you, um, you have to listen very carefully. If you listen in a noisy environment, you're going to miss the signifiers that are embedded in that, because that is another style characteristic. Let me back up. It is diatonic progressing harmony. It is a tonal piece with normal art music progressions. Third characteristic is there are signifiers embedded in the music and text that we are meant to hear and enjoy signifiers that are embedded in there that we are meant to hear and enjoy. That's what makes it postmodernist. So if you listen to this piece, um, you will hear the text being declaimed. Let me demonstrate what that text is. Okay. Shelby Clark has my Alice in Wonderland book. I had to go look up the poem before I was ready to read it to you. So this poem appears um, at the end of uh, Through the Looking Glass, the second book. 
And Lewis Carroll is sort of looking back with this nostalgic Zenzucht lens at Alice, the character, and the child, Alice Little, that he based his fictional character on. And he's looking with this really 19th century nostalgia of childhood. And also the just the, the sort of innocent, sweet time that he had creating these stories for Alice Little. I'm, there's more discussion we could have there, but that's for a cup of tea. You can come visit me in Oxford. So here's the poem. It's in, um, it's got three lines in each stanza. A boat beneath a sunny sky, lingering onward dreamily in an evening of July. Children three that nestle near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased a simple tale to hear. Long has paled that sunny sky, Echoes fade and memories die. Autumn frosts have slain July. This is where it gets interesting. Still she haunts me, phantom-wise. Alice, moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. He's talking about the memory of Alice. But this is a very modern sort of Strawberry Fields Forever stanza. She haunts me, phantom-wise. Children yet, the tale to hear, eager eye and willing ear, lovingly shall nestle near. In a wonderland they lie, dreaming as the days go by, dreaming as the summers die. So and there are more children in the future to hear this story. They will relive it and recreate it. But there's also this, it's odd, this is written before World War I, but I pick up this echo of... The, the lost generation, the lost summers, you, you dream your life away. Here's the final stanza. Ever drifting down the stream, lingering in the golden gleam, life, what is it but a dream? That's like row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. So here's this poem, it's from the 19th century. It's very 19th century poetry, but it's got these sort of weird, um, for telling echoes of postmodernism. Del Tredici sets this lovely, beautiful melody. It is heart, I find it heartbreakingly beautiful, partly because of its associations for, for me. My music history teacher's name was Alice, and she always played this as the last piece that we would listen to in music history. Every year, you people would say, have you had the final Alice yet? And we oh, so when you got it, you knew you'd gotten through music history. So I give it to you for that same reason. Um, and they played it at her funeral. Well, so tear up. So, but this poem is so postmodernist in more ways than one. Lewis Carroll, being a mathematician, liked to put logic puzzles and things in Alice in Wonderland. That's why Shelby has my edition of Alice in Wonderland. It's full of little notations that people have added, like, look, here's a hidden code, and here's a secret little cool joke, and here's a, it's full of them. So it's full of modernist, except it wasn't modernist, modernist little hidden structures. This poem has a hidden structure. Take the first letter of each line. A boat lingering in an evening. Children there. I'm spelling out the beginning of each uh, line. A-L-I-C-E. Alice. Every first letter of each line spells out Alice Pleasance Little. That was the name of the girl that he told the original stories for and for whom he had this this sort of adoration. Alice Pleasance Little. And he's regretting this she is now a grown woman. They wait, They have gone their separate ways, and there's nothing, you know, everybody's, you get old, you die, but she haunts him. So in this final Alice acrostic song, an acrostic means taking the, the first letters of things, and there's a hidden meaning there. So Del Tredici, listen to how it's performed. If you listen carefully, the soloist sings a boat beneath a sunny sky lingering on dreamily. But in the background, you hear the musicians musicians going, A, L, I, C. And the way they have to hiss it, you have to hear it, but it's hard to hear. Um, the way they do that, it, it almost sounds like Stockhausen's e exaggerated deconstruction of language. P. 
you know, it breaks it up. You have to kind of break it up into these things. So that's why this piece is such a great end of the 20th century piece. Um, because it pulls together all of these threads, it pulls together the 19th century thread in there as a postmodernist signifier. It pulls together the modernist love of hidden things, but now in a postmodernist way, see, they're all here. If you just read your Alice in Wonderland, you know. So, so it's there. We hear diatonic progressions again and diatonic melody because you know what? We survived an almost nuclear holocaust and you know, life has moved on and maybe there's hope there. It's a very optimistic sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. That leaves you to listen to um, Anderson's Oh Superman, which is cool because she was a pop artist writing music that becomes um, art music and then she sort of stays and dabbles between these genres and you have to listen to the Schwantner concerto which I think you will find that if you listen to Schwantner you will hear some diff some similarities in characteristics between um, John Adams uh, short ride and fast machine and some similar with the big sort of glorious tune big resolution you'll hear some similarities to Libby Larson with this energetic optimism and this return to tonal progression, but it's not, it's, and it's not hemmed in by sonata form and stuff like that. So, we've done it. We're touching the 21st century. I feel like I should say amen, but I will say instead, the end.